Hi everyone. How are you doing? Welcome to you all who are joining. Nice to have you here with me today. Hi, Sebastian. Hi, Diana. Same to you. Wishing you much love and peace as well. Namaste, Ganga. Namaste to you as well, Maria. Das Krishna, is that, a, is that a handshake, a high five? I'm happy to give you a high five or shake your hand, either one. Hi, hi Cheryl. Oh, it was lovely to be here. And it's lovely to be able to do this. It's great we have this technology, which means that even though I'm sitting in my living room in London, that I can share what I'm sharing with you all. And I hope that you in some way benefit from this positively. Namaste, Arindam. Welcome to you all who are joining. We haven't started properly yet. So please just take the time to relax and become present to where you are and also become present to what's happening with this live event as well. Lisa, hi, glad you could join us. As you're joining, I usually ask people to like the video or drop me a line in the comments just so I know who's here. It's great for me to know who I'm talking to. I feel like I know many of you, even though quite a few of you I've never spoken to in real time. It's, it's um, because we've been exchanging comments on Facebook and things like that. I feel like I know you all. Ruben, it's really nice to see you, as it were, see you in quotes. It's great to have you with us on the call. Is it Razik? Is that right? Hi, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us. Gustavo, hola. <laughs> so we do this Facebook Live every month. We do it on the first Thursday of every month. Oh, I can't pronounce your name. Hello. Um, is it Socia? That's a guess. Um, well, hello to you. Welcome. Yeah, we do this um, Facebook Live on the first Thursday of every month. Afterwards, the video automatically saves to my profile, so you're welcome to watch it again. And if you have any questions you want to ask me, you just ask a question in the comments, and I'll try and get through them all. It's really an opportunity to just to be still just to be still, be with ourselves, with our true self. So really give yourself the opportunity to experience that. More and more people have been telling me that, and this might sound a bit grandiose, but people have been telling me that when they're in my presence, they feel a sense of love and peace. Not everyone, and I'm not really aware of it, 
necessarily. Sometimes I am. So um, if if you find that when you're when you're watching this or when you're listening to me or or anyone really, but when if you find that you're feeling a sense of peace or love, then really seize that opportunity. Seize the opportunity to to let go and relax into that feeling of peace and love. You know, don't, you know, um, you know, we're on this Facebook Live call and I always encourage you to be present to the call and not, to, if you can, tr not to be distracted by whatever else potentially is happening with you at the moment. So welcome to all you who are joining. It's great to have you here. Richard, hi, nice to have you here with us as well. We haven't spoken in a while, so I hope you're well. And Krista, good to have you here as well. Hello to you. Feel free to drop me a line in the comments so I know you're here. Or like the video. So I was saying we do this we do this on the first Thursday of every month, but I hold a meeting every Thursday. So on the first days of the month we do the Facebook Live. And on the third Thursday of the month, we do another online meeting, which is a Zoom call. And that's like a Skype call. We can have a conference call and we can talk to each other. And I think that's much, much better. But it has less of a reach, you know, less people come to that. So it's usually a, sm a smaller group of us. And, and you're all very welcome to join me in two weeks' time. We'll be doing a Zoom call. It's really easy. You just literally click on the Zoom link. It downloads the program onto your um, onto your computer or your tablet or your mobile phone. And it's best if you've got a video and you can turn your video on and then I can see you and we can talk to each other. And it usually works really well and really nicely. So it'd be great if anyone here, you know, who's who resonates with what I'm sharing. And you don't have to resonate with what sharing, you know. I don't think I'm necessarily the best teacher or anything like that. I just think if you resonate with what's been shared here, then I might be um, someone who's beneficial for you. And if that's the case, then again, I encourage you to attend satsang with me um, in the hope that it'll be beneficial to you. Am I allowed to say that? Is that good non duality speak? Well, I, I'm happy to say that. Um, so then for those of you who are in the London area in, in the UK, the other two Thursdays, that's the second and fourth Thursday of the month, I have a meeting in Kingston-upon-Thames, which is in southwest London. Um, all my meetings are essentially free. It's all a free service. Um, that means you don't have to give any money at all, and you're very welcome to attend as many times as you like. That said, I do. Um, I'm, I gladly accept donations. On the heading of this video, you'll see a little link that you can click on should you want to donate. And I must stress, it's completely optional. Um, and there's also, you can go to my website, tomdas.com. I, I leave all my kind of content free there. So there's loads and loads of stuff I've written over the last few years on my blog. And it's really just there for, for your benefit, to see if there's anything that can benefit you there. And um, there's also a donate tab there, should you wish to donate. As I said, it's optional. I really, uh, if, if you feel moved to, then I'd really like you to. Otherwise, you know, you, there's no need. And as I said, you're very welcome to just carry on attending these satsangs. It's free and it's open and it's a gift. It's a gift from myself to you, and um, I don't consider you, you separate to me, so it's, it's just a natural thing for me, it's a natural thing. So we had a few more people joining. Who else has joined? Ollie, great to have you with us. Thank you for being here. Yo, Casper, how are you doing? Gary, Gary Forte, hello. It's really good to have you here with me as well. Namaskar. Namaste to you as well. Gosh, we've had quite a few others join. Welcome to you all. If 
anyone has any questions, do drop them in the comments. Do write the question in the comments and I'll try my best to answer. I'm just going to take my time and relax. Hi Anand, thanks for joining us. If you can tune into the presence of the meeting, that's great. If you can just relax and be still, that's perfect. That's all you need to do, really. The thoughts get less and less. The peace gets more and more. At first, because we're so used to relating as a body, mind, that's how we've been taught to relate to life. Say, so I am the body, I'm the mind. No one actually says I'm the body, mind, but it's there. The assumption that's what we are is there without even having to say it. So when you feel this peace, what happens is the mind interprets that and says, ah, I am feeling peaceful. I, the body-mind, are having a feeling of peace, of something that feels nice. So there's a subject in me which is the body-mind, which we take to be the body-mind. And then there's an object that we are experiencing, in this case a subtle object, peace. Subtle just means you can't see it with the five senses, or you can't perceive it with the five senses, but we still feel it, like any emotion or feeling or a dream state or um, psychic things. They would all be subtle objects, things that we perceive, but not with the five senses, we might perceive it with the mind, or perhaps a psychic sense if you believe in that stuff. So I'm feeling peaceful. As the thoughts come down, as we relax, as we open ourselves up to life, as we don't push anything away, and allow whatever wants to come in, we allow it to come in. Everything's welcome here. And then the peace comes in. And the mind might say, I, I'm feeling peaceful. We should just Karen relaxing. Karen relaxing. Allow thoughts to come and go. We don't have to latch on to any of the thoughts. We just allow them to come and go. It can become obvious. that actually it is not that I am experiencing peace. It can be, it can, it can dawn, it can dawn on us that peace is our nature.
piece is another name for the essence of what we are and that this piece is everything and everything is just an expression of this piece the body mind is not a subject that is experiencing peace which is what how we initially interpreted it no the body mind is a manifestation of the peace the body mind is appearing as a manifestation of peace and peace is what we are and it's non separate from everything so it's only peace So, while we're here in satsang, satsang means to be with yourself, to be with truth. And you could say it means to be with peace, because the depth of what we are is peace, peace beyond peace. Not just the feeling and sensation of peace, but that which cannot be put into words. that which we are sat sat sun sat sat is the sanskrit word that means being or truth or reality or isness isness existence these are all different ways of translating that sanskrit word sat and sat sun means to be with sat to be with yourself So it's not the body mind experiencing, the body mind is experienced. And it's all happening in peace. And peace is really just another word for consciousness or bliss or beingness. It's just that it doesn't feel very peaceful when there's ignorance. I'm going to keep this really simple. What is ignorance? Keeping it really simple, ignorance is thought. From the point of view of the seeker, that's a good working definition. It might not be a hundred percent accurate, or actually, it might be. But from the seeker's point of view, it's a great working definition. It's a great way of thinking of this, because pretty much ninety-nine point nine percent of thoughts are ignorance-based. They're egoic. They are rooted in the delusional belief that I am the body. I am the body mind. I am this little entity, limited thing, and therefore I am vulnerable and I suffer. And good things happen, and bad things happen to me, meaning good things happen to the body mind. Bad things happen to the body mind. And I'm like this little cork floating on the ocean of life, being tossed about by the waves of life. And sometimes I'm riding a good wave and it feels good. And sometimes I'm in a storm and I'm crashed about and it feels terrible. And this is the ocean of samsara, the ocean of suffering, the ocean of ignorance. And when we relax, we can see that this samsara, this ignorance, this suffering is all happening in peace. 
It's all an expression of peace. And as we allow ourselves to relax, then the actual sensation of peace starts to emerge. It won't always be there because sensations come and go. No phenomena will exist forever because all phenomena arise and then they eventually go. But there's a piece that is synonymous with sat, this isness, this beingness. And that is alive and illuminating our reality and is the reality. This is the sat, chit, ananda that we are. And the world that seems so real and in many ways is real. And that which we consider our life is a play upon this magical screen of consciousness. And from the seeker's point of view, from somebody who's seeking, it is wise to look after the body, look after the mind, to adhere to one's responsibilities in life to be kind to be loving to be ethical to be generous to be giving all these virtuous things all these common sense things that we know in our hearts anyway we don't need a guru or a book to tell us we are we're honest with ourselves we know this already you, you be an upstanding human being you have upstanding ethics and you're good to yourself, your body. You treat your body with respect. You treat yourself with respect and you extend that courtesy to others. And so on one hand, you look after the body, mind and your responsibilities with the, in, in interacting with society and the world. And on the other hand, you see this life as a magical illusion appearing in the screen of consciousness like a dream and you relax into isness into beingness into peace and you dissolve away there you dissolve into that peace This is a wonderfully simple and dare I say it magic formula for enlightenment or liberation or self-knowledge or to put it much more simply for unconditional love and bliss to arise and for suffering to end. The transformation appears to occur, but in reality, the truth is always here. The truth is shining bright as everything all the time already. So in truth, there's nothing you need to do. But we prescribe things to do only because there appears to be ignorance getting in the way. So the prescriptions are to remove the ignorance that appears to be in the way. And of course, there's nothing in the way. Because the ignorance is just this. It's just an expression of truth. And therefore it is not ignorance at all. You can't really explain it. It doesn't really make sense in words. But when you see it, or when it's understood, or when it's when the you dissolves, really, because you can't really understand it either. I don't understand it. I am it. And so, same with all of you. None, none of you can understand it. You are it. We're not separate.
as the great Sri Ramana Maharishi said, there are no others, meaning there are no other people here. It's an illusion. So take your time to relax into beingness and realize that all there is is beingness. Everything is just beingness. Everything is you. Beingness just means the self. And the self just means you. And you are everything. And everything is happening in you. You never move. You never change. An analogy is a cinema screen that never changes and never moves regardless of what's appearing to occur in the movie. And this can start off as a conceptual thing, as a thought-based concept. But if we abide in this thought-based concept, in this conceptual framework, it takes us home. It's a beautiful teaching. It resonates with depth and truth and self, true self, truth. And the conceptual framework takes us home. It eradicates ignorance. And then itself, the conceptual framework itself then disappears. And we're left with nothing and everything and that which cannot be spoken of at all. Okay, so we've had quite a few questions whilst I've been spouting my monologue. It's great to have everyone here with me. Thank you for being here. Let's see who's joined. Shimoi, welcome. Mary, well, great to have you here as well. Hope to see you in London at some point over the next few months if you can make it down. I can see a couple of questions. Edward, nice to have you here as well. Omay, thanks for being here. Anne Booth, good evening to you. Good evening to you too. And Oti, great to have you here as well. It's been a while. I don't think I've heard from you in a while. Good to see you. And is it Willem? Is that right? Or is it Willem or Willem? Hi to you as well. And John Sherry as well. Hello to you. Well, so welcome to everyone who's just joined a bit more recently. Let's see what we're doing for questions. Gustavo, Gustavo, you've asked, what about this aliveness or consciousness that is functioning through this body? What about this aliveness or consciousness that is functioning through this body? What about it? Does aliveness say it is functioning through the body? Does aliveness say, does it tell you, hey, you hoo hello. I'm aliveness, I'm functioning through the body. It says no such thing. There's just this aliveness. And then there's this appearance of the body. Yeah. As, as the mind becomes still, hmm, as the mind quietens down, the body mind takes secondary place to the stillness or the aliveness. And that beingness, that isness, that aliveness, that consciousness is non-verbally sensed to be primary and the objects that are appearing to us including the body mind that we take to be the subject and the doer and me that comes to be secondary it's an intuitive thing you can understand it on the level of the mind but the conviction the deep conviction can't occur just through thinking about things mentally through thought
And as the mind becomes still, and remember, the mind is the distorting factor. Thoughts are that which has the apparent potential, they appear to have the potential to distort reality. They can't really. But it's because we're hypnotized and we're in this kind of illusion or dream world of thought. And the hot energy and momentum that comes with that thought. We get caught up in it, that's called ignorance. And we take ourselves to be a limited entity, the body-mind. But through being still, the, the, the ignorance loses its hold on us. And this reality becomes clear. It manifests itself. It teaches us itself. The vision of truth, the vision of non-duality comes to us. And this is why this teaching, at least for me, is free to offer to you all. It's free because, I don't know how to put it. It's open. It's nothing that I have. It's not Tom's. It's nothing to do with Tom. Although it might appear at one point in life to be expressing itself through Tom. Really, Tom's just like a piece of dust in the corner of a room. You know, you you imagine being in the room with bright, shining light, God, presence, being, bliss. This amazing, wonderful thing that is us, that's our true self. And Tom's just sort of like particle of dust in the side of the room. Imagine if now that small insignificant thing started saying, ha, huh, you can, I will teach you all about the light that you already are, that we all are, that is us. There is no us. There's only that this that cannot be spoken of accurately effectively So take the time to relax and be still. That's the essence. You could say there are two main essences of the teaching. One is to relax, to be still, to allow everything just to be come and go, not push anything away, not push thoughts away even. And through doing that, the thoughts will gradually lessen. lessen. They, get, they reduce over time and the body relaxes. The body achieves a natural balance by itself if left alone. And the mind does the same and the intelligence, energy, functioning, appearing to function, that's the same. And then the vision of non-duality dawns by itself. There's no subject object there. There's just, there's just you. And everything is appearing in you, but not in a subject object way. There's no perceive or perceived, there's just you. If there's just you, how can there be a perceiver or perceived? That's the duality, the subject-object duality. In Vedanta teaching, they call it a dyad. A dyad meaning a two-pronged thing. And there are triads as well. There are no triads. There's a triad would be an example of a triad is a seer, the seeing, and the seen. Or a perceiver, perceiving, and then the perceived. These triads are also an invention of thought. Does this aliveness say, oh, you are seeing me, I am seeing you? 
It doesn't, it's just what is. Well, as the mind becomes really still, the presence, the sat, this knowingness, this presence, this consciousness becomes primary. You don't have to trick yourself into believing it. You can do that, and that's fine, because it's in line with truth. But it's still just a mental thing. But when the mind really quietens down, and the depth and the ignorance, see, the mind is ignorance. So when the mind's quietened down, temporarily the ignorance is not so active. And that allows this to be seen or intuited. You can't really put it into words. And then all these, te then all these teachings make sense. But if you haven't had that depth of stillness where the ignorance isn't operating, it doesn't make sense. And this is why satsang is so important. Satsang is either being with a teacher or more importantly, being with yourself. And you're always with yourself. How can you not be with yourself? The self's always here. You're always self-realized because you always, you always know you exist. So knowing that you exist and knowing that you're not the body-mind, that is such. So the first part was to quieten down the thoughts. The second part was to know you're not the body-mind. Know that the body-mind appear in you. Again, it's just concepts. It's just playing with words. Unless the depth of the stillness of mind is there. In which case, ah oh yes, that's the reality. Otherwise, it's like, well, how do you know that you're not the body mind. Maybe I'm the body mind who is conscious. Yeah. Maybe the seat of consciousness is in the brain. And yet you read through the Buddhist scriptures. You read through the Tibetan Buddhist scriptures, the Mahayana scriptures. The great the scriptures, the great vehicle of Buddhism. You read through the Vedanta scriptures, the Hindu scriptures. You read the, the mystic Christians. You read Zen Buddhism. They all say this in different ways. And you can search through my blog at tomdas.com. I've written about this many times. And you can see this. You can see how it's all there. They're all testifying. This is the way it is. You're not this limited body mind entity. That's an illusion. They frame it in different ways, but that's the essential thing is to see through the illusion of being limited. What you are cannot be put into words or known. You don't need to put it into words or, or intellectually know it. It's what you are. You are it. You don't need to become yourself. You don't have to become self realized. You just have to lose the false idea that you're a limited thing. And that's the purpose of satsang. That's the purpose of this call, this meeting, this Facebook Live. And it's just the way it already is. Which is why it's freely offered. In the silence, all the questions dissolve. There's no doubts in the silence. There's no questions. There's no thoughts even. Thoughts can appear. Just like a bird can fly in the sky. You can see a bird flying through the sky. You can see a thought appearing. But it's not thought. Because it's not your thought. So it doesn't feel like you're thinking or there's any thinking. So someone else might say, hey, but Tom, you're thinking. So, no, no, there's no thought here. But to say that, you'd need to think, wouldn't you, Tom? Well, I guess you're right. And I can see that kind of thing's happening. There's no actual thought. It's just...
images on a screen are flickering. It's life. And that's what life is. That might sound quite depressing because when you're attached when you're attached to life, when you're attached to the images on the screen, it's like, what do you mean that's just images on a screen? Isn't that a really negative way, a pessimistic way of viewing the world? But when you're saturated by love, peace, bliss, oneness, non-duality, whatever, it's like, no, this is beautiful. This whole thing is beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful Maya. Gorgeous, sumptuous, clear, present Maya. But it sounds negative to the mind in the just the same way as an analogy. We can take an analogy of a drug addict who loves taking their drugs and partying and getting high. And you tell them, hey, you know, you don't, don't take drugs. You don't need to take drugs and party and get high. They might say, well, that's a bit negative, isn't it? This, these things are fun. This is my life. And you're taking away all the fun out of my life. It's a very dry kind of existence you're talking about without drugs and party. But wow, how wonderful and fulfilling and wholesome life can be when we're not abusing our bodies and minds. When we're not abusing our bodies and minds with substances, with bad food, with too much food, with toxic environments, with gossiping. I like a bit of gossip sometimes, I must say. <laughs> but when I say gossiping, I mean like the serious gossiping. <laughs> serious gossiping. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. With, and we abuse ourselves with our thoughts with our ideas, with our concepts, with our beliefs, with our dualistic ways of seeing things. It puts such a stress on the body-mind. It's damaging to us as human beings. It's damaging to our mental health. See, one of the wonderful things about self-realization, enlightenment, oneness, wholeness, is that it leads to a wholesomeness on the human level. Men, good mental health, well-being, it's a wonderful side effect. It's not the purpose of the teaching, but it's a side effect because the energies within this appearance of Maya start to harmonize and equalize and become nice. It feels lovely. Not always. There are going to be ups and downs in this samsara, in this appearance of life. But it's a hell of a lot easier. That's the truth. All we've got to do is rest as we are, rest as who we are, rest in truth, in the self, be the self. Be the self, what does it mean? It means to be still, it means to be calm, it means to be aware, awake. And it means to be without the belief that I am a limited entity, without the belief in I am the body-mind, which basically means without belief in the me or the I. And instead, I is everything. I is everything. Everything is I. Everything shines as I. Everything is shining, meaning it's here. No subject-object duality, just everything's here. No concept that, oh, I'm looking at this, oh, I'm doing that. No, it's just life. Self. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm not doing very well at answering your question so far. So sorry about that. That was like the first question. <laughs> I just went off on a whole another monologue. Hey, okay. hope you're enjoying it. And as I said, like some people, when they're at these meetings, and I don't claim I don't claim this is anything to do with me, by the way. But this is what some people tell me is that they feel this kind of this kind of transmission, let's say. And I was telling the group last time with a Zoom call, I think I was saying the same thing. I even find this transmission. I was watching one of my own YouTube videos um, a few weeks ago. Just think, oh, okay, let's see what this one's like. I think I was watching it before I posted it because there's a really nice person who um, edits these this kind of footage that we're going to get on the Facebook Live today and edits them up and puts and cuts them into a video for me and then sends them to me. So I watch them and then put them up on YouTube. So if that person's here, many thanks. That person doesn't want to be named. Um, but, you know, much gratitude to you for doing that. And if anyone else wants to help with anything that I'm doing, by the way, please reach out to me. I'm really open to, um, you know, if anybody wants to help me sort of spread the word, with, not in an evangelical way, because it's not like that. This is just, it's here if people want it. And if people don't want it, then that's fine. Yeah. As I said, I don't consider myself to be the best teacher or to be particularly special. It's just that if this works for you, if it's working for you, if you're resonating with it, then come. I'm here. I'm here for you. You know? And if something else is working for you, then go there. You know? And if 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 I'm if what I'm doing and what someone else is both working, then come to see both of us. You know, I'm really open in that sense. What was I saying? Oh yeah, if you want to help me spread the word in a non-evangelical way, then please reach out to me. But what I was saying before that is that a lot of people have this, they, they tell me they have this sense of openness and love and presence and some kind of transmission when they're at satsang with me. And to be honest, I really have no clue about that. You know, it was, it was a surprise to me when people started saying that to me. I've heard about it with other teachers. Or, you know, when you hear about, for me, great teachers like Ramana Maharishi, there's all these stories of people coming into contact with him and having these experiences. You know, I don't really associate myself with that. But then people start telling me things. So I'd be really interested to hear if people are having that kind of transmission. Um, I'm really interested. I'm really fascinated to understand that and to learn about that. And if you're not have, if you sort of, if you resonate with what's being said here, but you aren't receiving that kind of transmission energetically or on a feeling level, then I just ask you just to open up your heart, just to relax and allow yourself to feel happy and good and calm and at peace. And that's my understanding. Having talked to people, that's going to maximise the chances of that transmission happening. And it's powerful. I've seen the effects on people. It's really powerful. Their mind can become so still. You know, some people with very, very busy minds, they can suddenly become quite still. And they can feel healing energy come into them as well. So it's really, really wonderful thing. And as I said, I don't, people say it happens when they're in my presence, but I don't think, I don't sort of claim ownership to that. I don't think, you know, it's not like I understand what's going on there. Or I'm authoring that. It's just something that some people say that happens. And if it's not happening to you, then that's fine. I often tell people the story of when I was seeking. Sometimes I'd see a teacher, very rarely actually. I wasn't into really into seeing teachers. And I was more like a bit of a loner. I like to do everything by myself. I wasn't into the whole group thing. So sometimes I went to like a meeting. And people would say, wow, there's so much love here. There's so much love in the meeting. And I'll be sitting there just going, what? There's, I can't feel anything. I'm not, I'm not getting any of that stuff. So if that's you as well, then, you know, 
please be assured, I hope I can reassure you by saying you're in good company, because that's what it was like for me. I never got any of these transmission stuff. The only time I felt something was later on in my seeking journey, when I stopped seeing teachers, not that I saw many in the first place, and I fell in love with Ramana, Ramana Maharishi, through his teachings, through seeing his pictures, and that really took me by surprise. I fell in love with him. And I'm still in love with him. Still completely in love with him. And I don't see him as any different to me or you. He's everything. He's he's such an Ananda, which is what I am, which is what which is what everything is. It's only him. And because I have a personal relationship with his teaching, his expressions, I express it like that. It's all him. My life is him. He is everything to me. He is everything. He is God. He is me. It's strange, isn't it? I never thought I'd express myself in that kind of way when I was seeking. But when the devotional aspects of the teaching, well, I'll speak for myself, when the, devotion, the devotional aspects of the teaching hit me, it really knocks me for six. For those of you who are in the States and, don't, and never watched a game of cricket, not being knocked for six is a metaphor in the cricket. When you, in cricket, when you hit the ball really hard and it goes out of the whole cricket pitch, you get six runs. You hit six. It's just like you bowled over. And it just knocked me off my feet and shocked me. I was surprised. I was like, what? I'm in love with a, a dude who's dead and who I've never heard speak. What's going on? <laughs> What's happening? But I like it. It feels nice. It feels right. It doesn't feel weird. It sounds weird when I think about it, but it doesn't feel weird at all. It feels, it feels really right, really, really awesome. And this kind of loving spirit energy kind of took over my... No, that sounds too weird. It wasn't a loving spirit. It just... No, it was just me. Um, me and love merging. There was no kind of being taking over. It was just like very, very quiet in a way. It was very personal. I didn't talk to anyone about it or tell anyone. I didn't have the urge to talk to anyone about it. It was just something, something that was happening internally within me. Very strange. Very strange how things happen. Okay. I've done really bad with your questions today, haven't I? So let me, let me see what questions we have. Um, oh dear. So on my Facebook live feed, I can't, I can only scroll up so far. And because, so I've missed quite a few questions, I think. So I'm really sorry about that. Razik, I've just read what you've written. That's amazing. That's amazing that the same thing's happened with you. That's so cool. I'm very happy for you. Yeah, I was saying that when I watch one of my own YouTube videos, I was watching one of my own videos, <laughs> and I just suddenly felt this wave of peace emanate from like my own video. I thought, gosh, there's like such a strong transmission here from this guy. Oh, that's me. You know, it, it was bizarre. So this isn't a personal thing. I don't think it's, I don't know what, I don't know what was going on with the video thing there, but. Yeah, that was, I was, I was receiving a strong transmission from my own video. And it was just these waves of peace emanating off this particular video. If we, for those of you interested, it was, it was the hare and the tortoise video. If you if you Google my YouTube videos and Google the Tom Das Hare and Tortoise, I don't know. I just happened to be watching that one before I posted it. I think it was, and wow, I thought, gosh, this guy. It was funny. I, I obviously I knew it was me that I was watching, but the thought that went through my mind was, gosh, this guy has got this really, <laughs> this really <laughs> centered or 
really peaceful energy coming off him. And that's what sometimes it's like for me. I will talk about myself in a way that can sound maybe to some people as being quite arrogant or you know, I'm bigging myself up in some way. But for me, it's not like that. For me, it's just like I'm talking about things in a very factual, very matter of fact way. Oh, and it happens to be me that I'm talking about or this appearance of Tom that I'm talking about, you know? Okay, I can see a question, and it's just the one that, it might not be the first one that was asked, so apologies about for people who have asked questions before, and I'm not answering them. If you still want to ask a question, just keep on posting it on the comments until I finally see it, because as I said, I can't, the Facebook live feed isn't allowing me to scroll all the way up to the top. It's limiting what I can see from the earlier posts. But Jupe Van Herc, you've got a question. Hi, Tom. Why are thoughts so strong? Jupe, you've asked, hi, Tom. Why are thoughts so strong? I don't know. No idea. Why are thoughts so strong? No idea. Oh, I can tell you, I've got a few theories I can come up, I can tell you about. It's because for birth after rebirth after rebirth, the habitual tendencies, the vastness have been strengthening themselves around ignorance, around illusion. And this has lent, this has created these really strong habitual tendencies, which is what we experience, right? This is a theory. It's a traditional theory. And it's one I personally, that this Tom Das character quite likes. I quite like that theory. I don't know if it's true or not though. You'll find countless, if you ask why is something the way it is, you'll find countless theories your mind will come up with some, you might believe some, the countless theories explain why things are the way they are. And maybe you'll have a theory that's correct. Maybe you will have a deeper insights into that than I do. But what you end up with is your strong thoughts. Why are thoughts so strong? So that means you've got strong thoughts, strong habitual tendencies that are leading you here and there leading you hither and thither. So the focus of the teaching is not to understand how we got here, but to understand what do we do about it. You know, so it's not, I'm suffering, why am I suffering? But what can I do about that suffering? And obviously the question, why am I suffering, is a part of that answer. Because if you can understand the mechanics of the suffering, that might give you a clue as to how to end the suffering. Just like if there's some, if you've got a car that's broken down, if you can understand why the car's broken down and diagnose the problem in the car, then you're going to perhaps be better able to fix it. So why are thoughts so strong? The essential reason the reason why we cannot calm our thoughts down is because we believe that we are a body-mind. We believe that we are a doer entity. We believe we are authoring the thoughts. We are creating. We believe we are creators. We believe we are mini-gods that create thoughts, that create things. We believe that we are creating thoughts and actions. And that when that belief is there, and the thoughts are strong because we're naturally going to be a bit scared because we're limited and we're vulnerable. And if we're vulnerable, then something bad can happen to us in the future. We can die, we can become injured, we can be abused, we can ridicule, we can lose our social status. Ah, bad things can happen. And this strengthens the habitual tendency of thought. Thought is the ego. Do you remember I said, let's keep it simple. From, a, from the 
a good working definition for a seeker is that thought is ignorance. Thought is the ego. It might not be 100% true. It might be, you find, depending how we define thought and things. But it's the belief in self, limited self, that is this ignorance. And when it's seen that everything is one, everything is just consciousness. And these are just words. These words eventually have to go as well. These, these teaching words like consciousness have to go eventually. But for now, everything is consciousness. Everything is one. Everything is a manifestation within your unchanging, unmoving being. When the images on the screen move, the screen doesn't move. When the body mind moves, you're not moving. You can practice, you can do a little dance. And apologies about my dancing. <laughs> and um, you can realize awareness is not moving. The appearance isn't moving. The stillness is your essence. And when you key into that, then there are no thoughts anymore. There are thoughts appear, but they're just images. They're thought images. So it doesn't feel like your thought. In the scriptures, they liken thought to like a burnt rope. If you read the traditional scriptures and sort of from the Indian subcontinent, they'll say it's like a burnt rope. They appear, but they just know there's no substance. They're empty of any substance. In Buddhism, especially in the Mahayana and Vajrayana, which is the, the Tibetan, the Vajrayana is the Tibetan and Buddhism, or a part of it. And the Mahayana, this this great vehicle, the second wave, they talk about emptiness. How when you look you ask yourself, who am I? In some of the Mahayana traditions, ask yourself, who am I? And when you look, you can't find anything. There's just this radiant light of awareness, which has no substance to it, no essence to it. It's essenceless, empty, and present. And when you key into that, and you realize that's what you are. You can't know that because you are that. Just like you can't see your own eye. Just like you can't taste your own tongue. Just like you can't touch your own elbow, the same hand anyway. You can't, you can try. You can't know yourself. You are yourself. You don't need to know yourself. In that sense, you always know yourself. In the sense that you always are who you are. So in that sense, you that's self-knowledge. That's all self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is knowing you exist. Self-ignorance is thinking you exist as a body-mind. You remove the belief in, I exist as a body-mind. And then there's just whatever it is that self-knowledge it's just knowing you exist but not knowing but without the belief that you're the body mind without the limiting identity without the belief in a limited identity Hanana Guide, hello, how are you doing? Thanks for being here with us again. I always love reading what you have to say. Let me read what you've had to say. I think the transmission happens because of the fusion of our spiritual readings and knowledge, finding oneness with what you teach us. Wow. 
That sounds good. I like that. Compassion, the fundamental virtue declared by many spiritual teachers, beams. That's true. Sri Ramana Maharishi appears to me whenever I seek him. Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj, Jai Krishna Murti, many of these have talked about these things. And so we all feel one with everything you teach. Wow, it's amazing. I like that. I genuinely do. I genuinely do. I might be sounding a bit sarcastic there. Sorry if that's the case. I was probably being a bit sarcastic. But there, I think it just resonates with ourselves, it resonates with truth. Thank you, Chanana Goh. Let me like a few more comments here. I like that one. I like that one. Paul Schick, you asked a question here. You said, you mentioned recently that the Gita and the Bible are two important texts in your own spiritual journey. Very much so. How do you reconcile the two traditions? That is not in their terms of, not in terms of their overlap, but their differences. Well, I guess the thing about me is that I'm, I'm compared to your average person and perhaps even compared to your average seeker, I'm very well read in various scriptural traditions. I'm not a scholar. I'm not what you call in India a pundit, which is basically a, a scholar of the scriptures. Um, but compared to most people I meet, I tend to have, it just, seems that I've read a lot more than most. But I'm not actually, I've always been interested in just getting the essence, the gist of the scriptures, rather than, like I'm not very good at quoting scriptures, for example. Um, or if I can, I can only quote a very few number of things. I'm not very good at remembering all the different stories. And I, I do remember some, just because I've read so many of them. But I've forgotten so many of them as well. I've always been interested in the gist, the essence of the transmission. So it's interesting, your question is, how do I reconcile the two tradition, traditions? Not in terms of their overlap, but their differences. Well, I guess I'm like, when I'm synthesizing the information, I'm, I'm looking for commonality. And the differences, what I find is the differences are often quite superficial. Maybe they're because the teaching has come to us not from the original person who's talking but through a disciple or uh, someone who's heard the teaching second hand and maybe that's where there's a distortion in the teaching or the language is is different but they're trying to point to the same thing in my 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 mind so i read i always read these things looking for the what, what brings them together so i guess i don't reconcile them in terms of their differences because there are differences there are differences, but I cling to what's similar. And I, I find commonalities and that really lights me up. That really um, inspires me and motivates me. And yeah, it lights me up in that way. It, that's what inspires me about these teachings is the positivity and the love and the commonality and the truth they speak. Not, and there's a lot of rubbish in all these traditions, in some traditions more than others, in, in, the, in the Vedanta texts, in the Buddhist texts, in the Christian texts, you know, in the whole lot. There's a lot of rubbish there as well. And I think it's important to recognize that, to be discerning, to use your head and not and think about things and not just swallow everything not just believe everything because there's a lot of rubbish and a lot of impurities in the teachings from as far as i'm concerned 
but because the true teaching is not in any book the true teaching is is you could say it's in our dna it's with meaning it's within us i'm not actually talking about dna i'm saying it's within us we can get a we can resonate with the teaching that we read in a text or we hear from a teacher because hopefully if we're open and if our mind's quiet and receptive that truth resonates deep within our core it's wonderful so but you've got to be careful there's so many silly and dangerous teachings out there that can actually be helpful depending where you are in your journey they can be helpful at the time but then you can leave them behind once they've helped you don't be afraid to leave teachings behind once they've done their work for you I think sometimes people feel very guilty um, especially if they've been part of a group or a church or something and that they've got a lot of benefit from that church a lot of love a lot of healing and then they kind of say well it's not for me anymore you know thank you very much I appreciate what you've done but I feel like you're holding me back now hold on I think I'm gonna turn the light on hold on a second I'll be back in a second Oops. Oh, and I've just seen Tim Pliss. You're here as well. Great to have you with us. I'm really glad you joined. And um, I've really been inter I've really been enjoying our interactions on Facebook, Tim. I don't know. I just feel this really open, loving energy whenever I'm interacting with you. So I don't know if you feel that too, but thanks so much for that. I really appreciate it. Tim and I have done a meeting together. It's the first time I've only met Tim once before. And um, we did a meeting together in London. And it was really nice. It was really nice. Um, and I hope we can do it again one, one day at some point. And Tim teaches, or he doesn't, he's, from his point of view, he doesn't teach. He's one of these sort of radical, non dual type things, if you don't mind me saying, Tim. So it's a very different expression to the way I talk about things. But I liked it. And what was I saying? Oh yeah, um, because the, the heart of the teaching is within us, we can resonate when we read things. So I'm not answering your question, Paul. I'm sorry. I don't reconcile the differences. I don't. You can always reconcile the differences. I think sometimes there are genuine differences within teaching traditions. But I'm not so interested in. whether or not a teaching is true or not. I'm interested, I was always just sort of inspired by religious texts and spiritual scriptures and things because there was something in them that I sensed that was true. And I've always been more interested in that rather than, I've not really been interested in learning about religions or studying religions for that, the sake of just learning and studying. I've always been a seeker, you see. So I haven't really been that interested in reconciling it or, or saying, oh, yeah. So I'm sorry. I, I feel like I haven't really answered your question, but I've given you my answer. Oh, John, you've asked a question I, and you've said I, you feel I've ignored it. Please post it again because I can't read it. And I'm sorry if I've ignored your question. Gosh, we've got lots of questions I've missed here so John if you're still here on the call please post your question and I, I missed it because I can't scroll up Claudette hello good to have you here with us Carissa hello to you too Saeed good to have you with us and you've written so good well I hope you're talking about this satsang that's great James Ferguson, you've written, that's a good question. Is there a quick way to awaken or do I have to wait till it happens? Oh, Paul, you seem to approve with my answer. That's great. Okay, let me see. Oh, 
What was the next question? Okay, the next question was from Sebastian. Hi, Sebastian. You've written, how can I stop myself reacting to negative thoughts and situations? How can I stop myself reacting to negative thoughts and situations? So when you know who you are, when you know the essence of you, never changes. When you know that you, in essence, never react. Why worry? When you know that everything is an appearance, a magical display, an illusory display, a dreamlike display of images flickering, sounds coming and going, and you are ever present, bright and shining throughout, unchanging, why worry? When the you that you take yourself to be is seen to be just a series of appearances, a series, is a series of image, images, why worry? The negative stuff can come and go. The positive stuff can come and go. Why worry? This is self-realization. This is knowing who you are, not intellectually only, but deeper than that. Through deep, deep, in, in, initially through intellectually knowing this, and then afterwards by abiding in deep stillness in which the mind is transformed Figuratively speaking, the mind is transformed into the self. You realize the little you that you take to be is an illusion. And the little you that you take yourself to be is the self. Is the big you. And the self is greater than that little you. Which is just appearing within it. And is an illusion. Now then the reactions that you talk about, Sebastian, the reactions to negative thoughts might still occur. But because you don't care about them fundamentally, the body and mind might do something about certain negative reactions. So it might there might be an appearance of caring and being involved. But fundamentally, deeply, there's no caring, meaning no worrying. In this, the word care in this sense means worrying. There's no concern 
with the negative thoughts, meaning we're not worried about them. Concern, again, not meaning caring in terms of love or appreciation, but caring in terms of worry. Then they, they, they disappear over time in the appearance of time. So I answer this question differently every time it's asked, by the way. But I think what tends to happen is that there's a response from Tom here to the questioner. So really, Tom has no teaching. But what the, the teaching is created when Tom interacts with a seeking energy. And the seeking energy draws a teaching out of Tom. So when I'm by myself, I've got nothing to say or teach. But when a question comes, that pulls an answer from Tom. So that was my answer to you, Sebastian. How can you stop yourself reacting to negative thoughts and situations? Know yourself as pure consciousness. That's my answer to you. There are no definitive answers to questions. The answers vary depending on the questioner the apparent questioner and the question and the time and the place. Someone else asked the same question, there would be a different answer perhaps. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how this all works or how it happens. It's just spontaneously happens like this. I'm, I don't choose any of this kind of teaching or anything or whatever. I didn't choose to be this or do this. It's just the way it appears. It's not even real. It's not even real. But in a way, it is real as well. Saeed, you've written something that's really nice. You've written, maybe thought is so strong because you believe so strongly that there is something external to attain which will fulfill you. And your mind believes just existing is not fulfilling enough. How profound is that? I'll read it again. Maybe thought is so strong because you believe so strongly that there is something external to attain which will fulfill you. And your mind, your mind believes just existing is not fulfilling enough. It reminds me of my metaphor earlier of the drug addict who feels they need cocaine and heroin to be happy and to live a good life. And the idea of living without cocaine and heroin is just hell. It's boring. It's dull. It's for losers. And how untrue is that? You see, from the point of view of the addict, Life without that which they are addicted to is misery and boredom. But for the one who is free of the addiction, it is the addiction itself that is hell and suffering. And that is what it is like from the point of view of the seeker addict who is addicted to thought and addicted to ego and addicted to the body and mind and will not give those up and is scared to give those up and finds it boring to give those up and thinks it's suffering to not have those things. You see? But from the point of view of the free, the one who is free, the one who is liberated, Jnani, the Jnani, the Jivan Mukti, the one who is free, it is the body mind that is the hell, the suffering. It is the samsara that is the suffering. It is the ego that is suffering. It's the me that is suffering. The belief in all that stuff is what the suffering is. And why bother? Why bother taking all those drugs? Why bother indulging in all that thought? 
You see, the seeker feels they need it. Most seekers don't really want to be free. Not deeply, not deeply. I like to think that the people who resonate with what I'm sharing are the exceptions to the rule. But I doubt that's the case. You've got to be honest with yourselves. Do you want to let this all go? Of course you don't. Most of you, of course you don't, because this is what you know. And this is why satsang and a teacher can be so important, because satsang can, through the transmission that can occur through silence and satsang, it can take you to a place beyond. And that gives you faith that these teachings are true. And love for the teacher, love for the teacher, respect for the teacher can also give you that faith. And by the way, when I say love for the teacher and respect for the teacher, I'm not talking about putting the teacher up on a pedestal. I'm not talking about glorifying the teacher or putting them in a higher level than you. That's, that's not healthy. But to have love for somebody, to have respect and admiration and gratitude towards somebody, there's nothing unhealthy about that as long as as you're not putting them up on a pedestal. You're not thinking, wow, isn't that person incredible? Isn't that person amazing? That person's so cool, so much better than me and so much better than all these other people. That's unhealthy. That actually points to a low self-esteem in yourself because you don't see your inherent worth. You project glory and worthiness onto someone outside of yourself. Whereas when you see yourself as inherently beautiful and worthy, then you can love and respect and admire and have gratitude for other people that are outside of you, as it were, without losing that self-respect and that dignity. You see the difference? You're not giving of yourself in that sense. You are, you're not losing part of who you are. So Saeed, you're right. Thought believes that there is something external to attain. The me wants to attain something. Whereas the me is an illusion, a fiction. The me cannot get this. You already are. You already are. Which means if you already are, if you know you exist, that self-realization, you already realized. Just remove the false belief in the body-mind. How to do that? And I think this is going to answer one of the other questions. I saw a question about what is the quickest path to, to liberation or something like that. Or do I just have to wait? No. The answer right now I'm going to give you, and again, it's slightly different every time, is no, what you can do, you can be still. And you can come to satsang. Coming to satsang is so powerful because there's a transmission and a teacher. You have manifested the teacher. Everything you're seeing and experiencing is a manifestation of you. So if you're watching me and you're resonating with me, that's not Tom, that's you. You've created an appearance of a guru or a teacher or whatever, or Tom. I just realized I called myself a guru there. I don't like calling myself a guru. <laughs> Because of all the connotations but you manifested yourself a teacher teaching you're teaching yourself so that teaching is powerful it's an opportunity for you within this dream story of life it's come within the dream you've you've now dreamed a teacher to teach you so come go to satsang if you resonate, if you, if you, if it feels right to you, for you, right, right for you, come. And then when you're not at satsang, be in the real satsang, which is that stillness within your heart, meaning stillness. Just reside as consciousness, not as the body mind. 
use the question who am I as an adjunct as a facilitator when you're quiet and still say who am I to whom do these thoughts appear to whom does this body mind appear it appears to me who am I and when you look you'll find nothing there you find life there, but no independent thing with any substance. It's empty, but aware. This aware emptiness, just here, shining, as everything. No particular thing is it. This light is there, it's unchanging light. That is also all these changing things, inseparably so. It's what you are, everything. There's no subject, and object there. That's a belief, that's a thought, that's a concept. So you naturally abide as the self. And there's no belief in body-mind. And no attachment to the thoughts, which is the same thing. Because the ignorance is not there. And that's the, that's the teaching. That's the teacher, that's the teaching, that's the realization. These three come together. Yes, there was James Ferguson's question. Is there a quick way to awaken or do I have to wait until it happens? Well, you see, as long as you take yourself to be an individual, it appears that you can choose what to do. So while it appears you can choose what to do, then choose to come to satsang and choose to be still. The other practice you can do is gratitude. Gratitude towards everything that's happening in your life and gratitude towards yourself. Because you need to build self-esteem and self-worth on a relative level before you can drop it all. Because otherwise, you're, because of the way the beliefs work, if you have negative self-esteem, it's too scary to let anything go. This is a very, very important part of the teaching. It's a relative, it's the relative part of the teachings that helps free so many people. It's, it's, it's a teaching within the dream, what the dream person can do to help themselves awaken. One of the most important things is to build self-esteem. Because when you have low self-esteem, you, you, you're so needy. You need whatever drug it is that you're addicted to. And I'm using the word drug now as a metaphor. Whatever you're addicted to, you need that. You need it. Maybe you need that relationship. You can't let go of that relationship, even if it's abusive on some level. You need it because you're so insecure and your self-esteem, your self-worth, and your self-love is so low. You need to work on your self-love and your self-esteem. You need to tell yourself, this is where affirmations and, and these kinds of teachings are often looked down upon and sneered upon by the non-duality community as being silly this is where they're so useful i love myself i like myself i'm okay whatever affirmation works for you builds up your sense of self-esteem and self-respect and self-love and then you become happier and you can have gratitude you develop positive gratitude is a positive feeling You develop gratitude and positivity. And the positivity heals you from negativity. The antidote to negativity is positivity. And this is where positive thinking and these kinds of things that are sneered upon and looked down upon can be so helpful. So when you have the positivity, once you're flooded with positivity, a wonderful love, which is all just an experience that comes and goes, right? But it's an important one on a relative level. Because without it, how can you surrender? How can you let go? Because you, otherwise you're too needy and small. 
and insecure. So make yourself secure. Make yourself happy. Sometimes a loving relationship, romantic or non-romantic, is so important. A good friend, a good mentor, uh, if you're lucky, a good parent, um, a lover, a partner, maybe even your child. A loving relationship can be so healing. So many different ways it can work. So we'll do whatever you can do. If you're, if you're, neg if you, there's negativity in you, root out the negative, root out the negativity with positivity. And a wonderful way to do that is gratitude practice. Gratitude to everything that happens in your life, and every, and gratitude and love towards yourself. Love towards everything that happens in your life, and love towards yourself. Then what? Then what? Then, once your life is flooded with positivity. And light and happiness and the negativity has gone largely gone and you feel happy about who you are and you love yourself and you like who you are and you forgive yourself and you like other people more and you're more forgiving of other people and you're happier in life then you can let go of the positivity you can't do that from a place of negativity as I've explained. It's too difficult. It's too much of a jump for most people. See, see if these teachings are resonating with you. If they're not, forget them. Find something better. Maybe that something better is something else I've said. <laughs> or maybe it's from somewhere else. Whatever works. If you're earnest, if you really want this, if you're honest with yourself, if your intentions are pure, life gives you what you need. Life gives you, it looks after you, it gives you what you need on this journey. Because life is you. And you give yourself what you need. When you ask for it. And it's pure. If it's pure, what you ask for is also what the universe wants for you. So it gives it to you. And it isn't always pretty the way it occurs. It isn't. It doesn't, it's not always the way you think it's going to occur. Sometimes it's very challenging. But that's sometimes what you need to grow. So once you've flooded your life with positivity, then you can let go of the positivity. You'll feel right. Some, at some point you'll think, actually, I don't need to do all this praying or devotional chanting or ecstatic dancing practice or these affirmations or... Um, you know, going to these kirtans and doing the yogic practice. I don't feel like I want to do those anymore. I've just grown out of them. And you let go. Now you just let go. This is the renunciation. Renunciation means letting go. You just let go. You let go of everything. And it will go. And then it's when you come to stillness and silence. And dare I say it, indifference. You become indifferent to things. And it's not a negative indifference. It's not a uncaringness, because caring and passion and love often happen. But you don't care about being loving. You just sometimes are loving. You might not always be loving, but that's okay. But there's a, there's a, the, the seeking energy you see is disappearing. And that's the indifference I'm talking about. It's actually being more present. And clear the mind becomes clear in Sanskrit remember for those of you who heard me talk about this before in Sanskrit the, the word for the negative energy is Thomas T-A-M-A-S in English and the word for the positivity is Rajas or Rajasic energy, R-A-J-A-S. And then when you get that purity, the clarity, it's called sattva, S-A-T-T-V-A, sattva. And when you're sattvic, then this knowledge starts to dawn, then the insight teachings start to become more important. Non-duality comes into your life. And you start to see through the illusion of self. 
you start to see there's no one here. There's just a series of thoughts, but no thinker. Actions are happening, but no one doing them. Life is just happening the way it is, but no one's there doing it. So then you come to the realization of no self. But you, at that point, you still suffering will be something that just happens, you know. Pain happens, pleasure happens, suffering happens, neuroticism happens, yeah. And then what happens, there's a deep letting go. This is the purification after the insight into no self. And there's a deep letting go. And the addictive tendencies, the neurotic tendencies, fizzle away. They dissolve into awareness. They, everything just becomes one with awareness, one with you. And the duality disappears. See, when there's an insight into no self, there's still a duality often that's there. There's still a sense that I'm the body-mind, but it's all just happening. Or I'm the body-mind and I know that there's consciousness here. But you're not sure whether, you know, it's all, there's a, there's a, it's all conceptual actually, still. And then not even there's a deep, deep letting go, which usually can only happen after, into the, after the insight into no self. Because when you take yourself to be a self, again, you, the, you can't let go because you're too insecure. But when you have the insight into no self, that facilitates a deeper letting go because you're not so worried and neurotic anymore. And then it all just dissolves into oneness, as it were. That's just the term. You can't put that into words. So you, you have to use these poetic words like dissolves into oneness, just into love. Everything becomes love. But it's not about a specific feeling. It's just the way things are. It's all just you, you could say. JB Clement, good to have you with us. Sebastian, you've got a smiley face. I assume that means you approve of my answer. Jupe Van Herk, you've written, thank you. What have you written? Thank you again and again. Oh, thank you. That's really kind. Thank you very much. Cheryl, you've written, thank you, Tom. And you've got a nice Namaskar, Namaste sign, so I'll give you a Namaskar back. One thing that's happened to me is I end up just doing this all the freaking time. You know? I just end up, I, just, I don't know. I never thought I'd turn into the guy who's doing Namaste all the time. The way I, way I when I was younger, um, my, my family originally from India, and I was born in the UK. So one of the, the, the tradition, when we see other people from the same part of India as us, the, the greeting we have is Namaskar. That's na Namaskar, Namaskar in Sanskrit, Namaskar in Bengali. So we used to go to Namaskar. And it, I, it, when I was younger, I was taught that's just how you say hello. That's just say, so everyone's going, Namaskar, Namaskar. Hey, how you doing, Namaskar? Yeah. And um, people also, like if you, um, maybe if one of the Bengali people who um, was in our community was one of the younger ones and they met an older one, they'd often prostrate, they'll touch the, we call it pranam, they'll touch the older person's feet with their hands and then they'll even touch the head of the person's feet. So I used to see this all the time, people literally, and I and my parents used to go to me, look, go pranam, pranam, pranam. So if you walk into someone's house, we just sort of go down to their feet and do this thing. And it, it, I didn't understand what it meant. We just had to do it. And then when I got older, I thought, oh, God, I thank God I don't do this rubbish anymore. You know, namaskar and pranam. You know, and you throw yourself down at the feet of the, some old guy who's walked in the house and maybe his feet are a bit smelly. Oh, oh gosh, you know, what am I don't do it anymore. Now, <laughs> and now it's come full circle for me. Now I'm just, you know, for me, it just means I appreciate your presence. When I see somebody, 
it's just an expression of love and happiness to see someone. Namaskar, I bow to you. And I find myself inwardly, I mean, if I could, if it was socially acceptable, I'll probably just be throwing myself at the feet of so many people I pass and meet. Just saying, no, oh, it's so nice to be in your presence. But I sort of inwardly, I meet people and I'm inwardly just namaskar to them. You know, and it's me. I, I'm just, it's all me. I know that, that not in a megalomaniac or egotistical way. It's just, it's not separate, you see. It's non separate. It feels so right. And to my wife and to my kids, I just bow at their feet. They are, they, for me, they're, they're the divine. Everything is the divine. I've got these um, photos of like um, gods and Ramana and these idols, murtis they're called um, in, in most Indian languages. Murti is the word for these sort of images of God, statuettes. It's all, it's not, for me, it's not an image of God, it's God. You know, when I, when I, when I bow and pranam and namaskar to these figurines, like these bits of metal or these bits of wood. That is God for me. I'm, I'm bowing to God. And when I, when I bow to my wife's feet or to my children's feet, yes, it's my kids. Yes, it's my wife. It's God. I'm bowing to God. I'm bowing to myself. And when on this call I do this to you, I am transmitting my my love and appreciation and thank thanks and gratitude to you it is wonderful to be here with you all i just see you all as enlightened beings all as beingness all as enlightenment not enlightened beings not meaning separate individual beings but you're all we are all oneness together beings of light. I know that might sound a bit woo-woo, but it just feels like that to me. There's no separation. And it expresses itself like this. It's wonderful, it's love. It's just love, the way it expresses itself. And it's not intent, I don't, I don't intend to be like this. A part of me is still cringing. <laughs> when I see myself, you know, the kind of younger me, that rebelled against this whole Indian thing that I was brought up with. I don't know if that makes sense to you. When I was younger, I hated being Indian or coming from that background. You know, people used to think my parents did things in a strange way and stuff, you know. It's funny how things happen. Auntie, thank you. Omei, where were you last meeting Omei in London? I hope to see you next week if you can make it. I'm just kidding, by the way. Last week um, in London, I had the smallest meeting I've ever had. Um, two people turned up. We're in the Druid's Head, which is the pub where we meet. And two people turned up. It was, for me, it was the most amazing meeting. You know, I, I, I generally encourage, I want more people to come to my meetings. My meetings aren't very big. They're quite small. And I want to, I want to share what is being shared here, right? Well, I say I want to share what's being shared. On the other hand, I don't really care as well. It's weird. I don't actually care, but the, but it appeared on the appearance level. Tom wants to share this, right? So it's when 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 the meeting when more people come to meeting. I like I'm happy. I'm like that's great. People are coming. That's great. So two people turned up at the last meeting. It was wonderful. We were just there was a lot of silence, 
And the feedback I got, there was a huge amount of transmission. Huge amount of transition. And what I hope is a lot of healing. It's really magical. It's, I have no idea how it works. Actually, I, I, I'm kind of getting a sense of it, actually, sometimes now. I'm not interested in controlling it, though. You can get a sense of how to control it, actually, how to control the um, the waves of peace. But there's no interest in it. In, in it, you, it, you just notice, oh, yeah, I can affect it. It's funny. I'm learning. I love learning from all you guys, from all the people that come along to these satsang. There's a Sanskrit word, um, darshan, darshan, D-A-R-S-H-A-N, darshan. And it traditionally means when you have the darshan of a teacher, it means to be in the teacher's presence. Whereas for me, it's like when I'm with people, and even on this online meeting, I'm having your darshan. That's what it feels like for me. It feels like, and when I was in this meeting last week, the two people were there. I was so um, thankful that they were both there. As individuals, I know we're talking about non-duality, non-separation, but I was so thankful that each of them individually were there. I was so grateful for their darshan. And I felt like they were there, my teachers. I felt like they were both my guru in that moment. Um, so um, I'm very grateful to have your darshan here tonight. Thank you. And the guru, the teacher, yourself, is constantly giving out its darshan, its grace. You just have to relax and let go. And these kind of teachings can help give you faith and confidence in that. It's a really beautiful thing. It's a really beautiful thing. And I'm in love with, with these teachings. Completely in love with them. And the love I have for the teachings is non-different from the love I have for life. And the love I feel for all of you. I really feel a lot of love for all of you. And the love I feel for Tom. Right? It's non-personal. I feel a lot of love for Tom. A lot of gratitude towards him. For all his interesting and peculiar ways. Because the more you get to know anyone, the more unique, let's say, you find out they are. Basically, we're all a bit weird and strange. So we can love each other knowing that. So landscape weavings, Carissa, you've written love and beingness together, giving thanks. Thanks to you. Vimal, love to you too. Saeed, you're one of the two people there at the last meeting. I'm really happy you were there and I'm glad that I was wondering how you felt after the meeting and how it's been for you the last week. But I'm glad it seems like it was positive for you. So I'm really glad about that. I felt like you, there was a huge breakthrough there for you. Sometimes I can sense when people have a breakthrough and it's happened a few times where I've realized I've sensed a breakthrough about a week or two before the person's actually realized what's happened. Um, so I don't know, but there have been a couple of times where during the meeting I've sensed a, something changed for the person I'm with and they haven't realized it. And then a week later they say, oh my gosh, this happened. I say, yeah, yeah, it happened like a week ago. Didn't you realize? I was, I was actually, I've actually been shocked that they haven't realized that because for me it was so apparent that something shifted in the meeting, during the meeting, I can even remember the moment that a shift just happened in them. 
an energetic contraction or a aha moment or whatever it is. And then maybe a couple of weeks later, oh gosh, I've just realized this. I said, yeah, you realized it two weeks ago, but you probably, it's only just caught up to you or something. You know, it's funny. Maria, Maria Manuela Franco, thank you as well. Ramana, Kumar, Balaga, thank you. Norishka to you. Oh, May, so you're going to be next, there next week. Excellent. You always get the transmission. That's really interesting. I'm really glad. I think the people who come to my meeting really, well, I said earlier the teaching is extracted from me metaphorically speaking, by the seeker, the seeking energy. So the, it's you guys that come to the meetings that affects my teaching, that creates my teaching. And I'm, you know, I hope you understand what I'm saying when I say my teaching. It's not Tom's teaching. I'm just using that as a label so we can talk about it. Um, and the, the way when people tell me more and more about the transmission, it affects the way it affects Tom as well. It's funny because what I've noticed traditionally, the te the scriptures say you should like worship the guru, right? And that's not been something I ever really encourage. I don't like it. It's too much open to abuse, especially in the Western tradition or the Western eye tradition, which is the Western eye society, which is present throughout Asia now as well. It's too open to abuse and scandal if you're worshipping a teacher. It should be red flag to you. If you ever come across a teacher who is making it about themselves and their personality and their charisma, that should be a massive red flag to you. Because it's not about a teacher or a teaching. It's not personal like that. It's not about a person who's an incarnation of God and aren't they amazing and aren't they? shouldn't they be worshipped and deified? No. That's a big red flag that you got. Your, that teacher is a megalomaniac. They're, they're egotistical, not teaching something true. Although it might be helpful to some people, even even false teachers might be of of help, and are of help. I can think of a few who have said some quite useful things, but you know, are way off the mark fundamentally. I won't mention any names. So don't ask. <laughs> or come to the London meeting. We get, well, I sometimes mention names afterwards at drinks. We have a drink. We often go for drinks afterwards. Um, what was I saying? Um, yeah. But what I've noticed is that when people express love and affection for what's been said here and for me, um, I actually feel um, when people express love for me, or love for the teaching, not in a put, not in a me, not in a putting me in the pedestal way, not in thinking, "Oh, Tom's amazing," but just like, "Oh, Tom, thank you so much. It was really, I, I was really grateful for what you shared." What I've noticed happens is energy kind of comes out of me and goes towards them. So that's really interesting. That because I'm not actually, I don't actually care. If people come to the meetings, I don't care if someone thinks I'm great or not. I don't care for any of that stuff. It doesn't. I, I'm not. In, I'm not interested in being adored or being. I, you know, if people think I'm good, that's good. If people don't think I'm good, that's good. I don't really care. It makes no difference to me. But what I've noticed is that when it's almost like a mirror, when people put something towards me, it bounces back and is reciprocated from me. So that's just something I wanted to put out there. I've noticed. I wonder if that's where the scriptural tradition of sort of worshiping the guru comes from. Part of it. They say, you know, when you approach a teacher, you should approach them, approach them with reverence and obeisance. And I don't know. It's a bit weird to me. That still feels a bit weird to me. Why should you have to be so obeisant and subservient towards a teacher? I don't. I don't like that dynamic. I don't think it's, it still doesn't fit right with me. But hey. Let's see what happens. Who knows what I'll be saying in a few years.
And Booth, you've written, thank you, dear Tom. We'll be at your next meeting. I truly enjoyed this meeting. Wish you joy, happiness, and peace. Thank you so much, Anne. Same to you. Willem or Willem, thanks, Tom, and everyone. Yeah, it's not just me. It's everyone. It's everyone. Auntie, thank you, Tom. It was good to be here. Okay, well, I'm getting the sense that it's time for me to wrap up now. It's been a couple of hours that I've been going on for. Let's take the time to thank everyone, including me. Thank yourself. Thank Tom. Thank life. Allow the gratitude to fill you up and take away the negativity. I pray for you. I wish you all peace and love and prosperity and happiness and positivity. And I pray that that positivity fills you up and heals you of negativity. And then I pray that positivity also leaves you and you let go of everything and become nothing. And when you're nothing and when you're <laughs> when you're dead, then you'll know yourself as pure presence. And then even that is just words. We let go of all the words and concepts. And then we're just back to where we are now. Come full circle. Wishing you all love and peace. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for making this meeting for what it is. My love to you all, my gratitude to you all. Our next online meeting is in two weeks, is Zoom. If anyone wants to donate, go to my website or click on the link above. Donations are completely optional, but are very gratefully received if you feel inclined to do that. Take care, everyone. Namaste. Namaste. My love to you all. <laughs>